Hello and welcome to another episode of Talk on Things and Stuff. Uh, it's been a little bit since we've had a posting, but I've had a lot of stuff going on uh, here on the home front, so I'm happy to be back into it. Uh, today we're going to continue our series where we look at some of the old blog posts from the Thoughts on Things and Stuff website and make sure that we have a podcast version of them that people can view on YouTube and Facebook and other media. So um, it's been a little bit. There was a, a really fun post that I put together uh, on a subject that I called Mormon Bubble Modesty. But it was a play on words and theme from something called Mormon Bubble Porn, which you haven't, if you haven't heard of, uh, we're going to go into a little bit so you'll see an example of what that's like. So let me just set up our sharing. Yu-Gi-Oh! has demanded that he be a part of this, and I try to keep him away, but he's, I don't know if ever you've ever had a dog that is so devoted to you that he goes crazy if he's not around you i'm usually a cat person you use my first like a dog as an adult and uh he is pretty demanding okay i got to do this hold up just give me a second here so we're gonna share this other tab and go to mormon theological bubble modesty and we will start uh as so okay let's see here all right Yu -Gi -Oh, you gotta stop that dude Okay, <clears throat> all right, let's make sure. Uh, if at any point during the presentation there are any audio or video issues, I'd appreciate it if you just drop a comment. I should be able to monitor that. All right, you. okay, I need you to calm down. You gotta chill, okay, dude? It's okay, all right. Okay, so here we go. The link for the article is going to be posted in the comments, so if you would like to go and read along and see everything in real time, you can click the links and find some of the sources there. Uh, and we're going to start. Mormon Theological Bubble Modesty. On February 19th, 2010, a day that will live in infamy, an internet user by the name of Fancy Lad uploaded a set of instructions on how to take an image that is not technically explicit and cover up just the right parts in a way that tricks your brain into thinking that the image is something that it is not. He called this technique a way to make Mormon porn. And you can click on the link. The original website is down, but I've included a link to the archive.org backup of that website. And if you click on the link, you'll see how the original post was. How to make Mormon porn. Step one, tie, find a picture of a beautiful lady. Ideal pictures will include as few clothes as possible and plenty of cleavage and leg. Step two, toss your photo into Photoshop, select a hard round brush, create a new layer and put dots on all the skin that you can find. I know this is counterintuitive, but there's another step coming. Step three, uh, select the transparency on your dot later layer and invert your selection, fill everything else in, and then layer that over your original photo. And suddenly all the parts that were skin are now see-through and all the parts that were clothing are obscured. Step four, enjoy your church-sanctioned nudity. And in the original meme that was posted, there's an image of a buxom uh, woman who he has done this technique to that you can see uh, how it works in that regard. So let's go back. Now, the technique was posted to other areas on the Internet with the story of a lonely Mormon boy who could not look at pictures of naked ladies because his faith restrictions on media use. But he found a way to sort of trick his brain into thinking he was and thereby achieve that teenage fantasy while still being able to say that he was worthy. The method involved putting a color overlay over an image of a figure who's wearing clothes and cutting out bubbles from the overlay that expose only the flesh of the figure while keeping the clothes portion covered. The human brain, having the remarkable ability to fill in the gaps with what it desires to see when presented with partial data, creates the illusion of a nude figure. Mormon bubble porn. And thus, Mormon bubble porn was born. Not technically pornography, so not technically against the restrictions set by the church, but it may as well be, because the human mind will fill in the gaps with what it wants to see. Here is an example of how it works. Take an image that you would not be immediately considered unworthy to view, and then bubble it. And here we've got an animated GIF that just shows a couple of uh, young ladies working out, 
and then slowly you can see the bubbles start to form, obscuring all of the clothed parts so that only the skin is exposed and your brain is left to fill in the gaps. Now, I suppose I should mention that it works on both genders, though when I was growing up, the warnings against pornography were really only drilled into the heads of the boys. So I assume that women are either immune to this stuff or don't have an imagination. Obviously not true. Here is the male equivalent. Yeah, very nice, yes. Uh, <clears throat> Somehow this makes it worse. Anyway, uh, repent. Now, after exposing you to such lurid images, I have some repenting to do. I really hesitated to include the above images, but they were necessary to understand the rest of this article. As a way of restitution, I provide the following image to bleach your eyes and mind from what I just exposed you to. Oh, it's a little fluffy bunny. There. The effects of that prior images should be wearing away. If your mind ever starts to wander back to the images you saw above, just come back to the cute, fluffy little bunny, oney, oney above. Uh, is it Mormon kosher? Now, any Mormon who's gone through the temple is familiar with this phenomenon. Adam and Eve are naked in the Garden of Eden while they are depicted in the film. However, strategic foliage, fauna, and camera angles cover up the inappropriate bits. Enough is shown to demonstrate that they are naked. Presumably the actor and actress were not really nude, and so those obscuring features were simply covering up clothed body parts, just like in the bubble examples above. Look at the bunny again if you need to. Despite the example from the temple, however, I can confidently say without hesitation that the bubble porn demonstrated above is absolutely not Mormon kosher. You see, according to Mormon theology, sin starts with your thoughts. We can see from the Book of Mormon, Book of Mosiah, quote, But this much I can tell you, that if ye do not watch yourselves and your thoughts and your words and your deeds and observe the commandments of God and continue in faith of what ye have heard concerning the coming of our Lord, even unto the ends of your lives, ye must perish. And now, O man, remember and perish not. Mosiah chapter 4, verse 30. This is reinforced by the Mormon interpretation of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5. Quote, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Matthew 5 verses 27 and 28. To Mormons, this verse shows that sin starts in your heart or mind and is a call for people to work harder on self-control and to overcome those things that reflect the natural tendencies of man. By doing so, they will become more godly and obedient to God's commands. This explains why it is not uncommon for Mormons to warn against pornography as a sort of gateway sin to other more serious iniquities such as adultery or homosexuality. In the recent April 2014 General Conference, Linda Reeves, second counselor in the Relief Society, warned that pornography, quote, overtakes lives, causes loss of the spirit, distorted feelings, deceit, damaged relationships, loss of self-control, and nearly total consumption of time, thought, and energy. These are all accepted teachings among Mormons and even among many non-Mormons. Theological Pornography LDS leaders have invoked the title pornography to describe another evil which may threaten the minds of curious members, that is, unflattering accounts of LDS history and theology. Vaughn J. Featherstone of the First Quorum of the Seventy warned of ex-Mormons who continue to study and write about the problems they find in Mormon history and theology, saying, quote, They publish theological pornography that is damaging to the spirit. None of it is worth casting an eye upon. Do not read anti-Mormon materials. Close quote. That's from the talk Last Drop in the Chalice, which you can find on BYU's website. Now, this is just one of many warnings given to members to avoid some anti-Mormon material. As a member, I was very careful not to entertain any anti-Mormon literature. While in college, a well-meaning friend gave me an anti-Mormon book purporting to tell me all about what Mormons really believe. I returned the book with a simple, I'm not interested, I already know what I believe. Now to a Mormon, anti-Mormon theological pornography is actually worse than conventional pornography. Pictures of naked ladies may set you back a bit and create a need for repentance, but... 
to read anti-Mormon literature was likely to strip you of your faith and leave you a godless atheist who would be cast into outer darkness. That is where the real danger lies. An apt metaphor. Does this idea of anti-Mormon material being equated to pornography hold up? Now, I don't know if Brother Featherstone was aware of it, but his analogy is perfect. You see, the material I read that start my own, started my own journey out of Mormonism wasn't anti-Mormon material, but the church history documents now available online at church websites like LDS.org, BYU's website, or Joseph Smith Papers Project, discovering surprising things that supported some of the anti-Mormon accusations I had faced during my upbringing really shook me. I decided to take a look at some of the stuff that I was warned was so damaging. Could it be true, too? I had faith that the church was true, and I am an intelligent person who was familiar with the basics of church history and doctrine that comes with almost 40 years of Sunday school, seminary, personal study of the standard works, and so forth. If it really was true, I would see through the lies and see that they were trying to tear it down. I checked out sites like mormonthink.com, a document called the CES Letter, as well as a website of Sandra Tanner at Utah Lighthouse Ministries. What I found astounded me. 99% of the material out there was simply reproductions of church historical documents, journals, newspapers, prior versions of scriptures, lesson manuals, and letters. Many of these were very difficult to verify before the age of the internet. How now, however, now every single document that I found at those sources and then turned to official Mormon websites to confirm was either absolutely verified or not available due to it being sealed away in church historical archives. Anti-Mormon literature is simply church history and doctrine which is laid bare and exposed for all to see. It is absolutely theological pornography because it has not been covered up, concealed, or overlaid with distorting obfuscation. The question I had to ask myself was, if this stuff is true and I've never heard of it, or in many cases have been taught conflicting things in my religious education, then how has the church managed to hide it from me, and why? Bubble Modesty the bubbling technique that I described above is actually a means of covering up the salacious parts of the human body, something which falls into the same category as conventional modesty, though certainly not as effective. As such, you may as well call this bubbling technique bubble modesty. When I reflect on the differences between what I was taught in my religious education and upbringing and what the history actually records, if seen in its complete form, I can see that the church has engaged in its own version of historical and theological bubble modesty. Allow me to demonstrate. Joseph Smith's polygamy. I was in my 30s before I realized that Joseph Smith was a polygamist. Now, this may be due to my thick skull, but it was literally never taught to me in the hundreds of Sunday school lessons that I sat through. Even today, it is minimized. Take the recent manual, The Teachings of the Presidents of the Church, Joseph Smith. Now, it completely avoids the topic of plural marriage and makes no mention of Joseph Smith's other wives, despite mentioning his first wife, Emma, 88 times. The timeline of Joseph Smith's life at the beginning of the manual mentions his marriage to, Aram, to Emma, but no other wives, no other marriages or sealings are listed. You can check. Furthermore, the fact that some of Joseph Smith's wives were already married to other worthy Mormon men is not revealed, and the fact that Joseph Smith had married girls as young as 14 while in his late 30s is not discussed. The church knows that these things are part of the historical record because early church documents report it. Even if an instructor knows of those facts or finds that they've been included in prior church-published documents, they are told to avoid teaching them. You can see the instructions in the most recent Doctrine and Covenants Seminary Instructor's Manual on section 132. There's a warning given on that page which reads as follows, quote, Use approved materials. Seminary and institute curriculum materials are provided as the main resources to help you prepare and teach effective lessons. You may use additional resources such as church magazines as you support students' understanding of the scripture block. Other resources should not be used to speculate or sensationalize lesson topics or to teach ideas that have not been clearly established by the church. Even if something has been published before, it may not be appropriate for use in the classroom. Choose lesson materials wisely so lessons can build students' faith and testimonies. 
This is from Lesson 140 from the DNC Seminary Teacher's Manual. The church only wants people to see those things which will affirm the polished image of the church. Disturbing things such as polyandry or dishonesty about polygamy detract from that image. Those parts have been covered up. Just like the bubbled parts in the image just like the bubbled parts in the images above, an apt illustration of the church's treatment of Joseph Smith's polygamy might be depicted as this. We start out with an image with Joseph in front of a bevy of young maidens, and we bubble every single one of them out but Emma. Historical bubble modesty and the wives of Joseph Smith. When viewed without the filter of modern correlation of lesson materials, Joseph Smith has numerous wives, but when you apply some bubble modesty, Joseph can only be seen with his first wife, Emma. Other examples. If you start researching and studying church history, you will encounter this phenomenon over and over. I've created some examples to help you see the difference between how the church wants its history depicted and how it was recorded in the gallery of theological bubble modesty. First, read the text in the bubbled version on the left, and you will likely agree that this matches the image and teachings of the church today. Then, read the actual full quote on the right, and you may find that it differs somewhat. First subject, monogamy. If we read on the right, where we've done a bit of bubble modesty, theological bubble modesty, and we have excluded all words except for those words which comport with the current concept of monogamy, it reads as follows. I've noticed that a man who has but one wife soon begins to look fresh, young, and sprightly, because God loves that man and his work and word. Some of you may not believe this, but I know it, for a man of God can keep up under the burdens we have to carry, and I know what we should do. Sounds completely consistent with the church's modern teachings. This is Heber C. Kimball from Journal of Discourses. But if we take away the theological bubble modesty and read the entire quote, it reads as follows. I've noticed that a man who has but one wife and is inclined to that doctrine soon begins to wither and dry up, while a man who goes into plurality looks fresh, young, and sprightly. Why is this? Because God loves that man, and because he honors his work and word. Some of you may not believe this, but I, also, I, I not only believe it, I also know it. For a man of God to be confined to one woman is small business. For it is as much as we can do now to keep up under the burdens we have to carry, and I do not know what we should do if we had only one wife apiece. Again, Heber C. Kimball, Journal of Discourses. What about the Adam-God teaching? Well, if we apply the appropriate bubble modesty, we can see Brigham Young teaching in the Journal of Discourses. Now hear it, O inhabitants of the earth, Jew and Gentile, saint and sinner. When Adam came into the Garden of Eden, he came into it with a body and brought Eve with him. He helped him to make and organize this world. He is Michael the Archangel, about whom holy men have written and spoken. Every Christian must hear it and will know it sooner or later. Again, it comports completely with modern theological teaching about the nature of Adam. But if we remove the theological bubble modesty and look at the quote as it was originally recorded, it reads as follows. Now hear it, O inhabitants of the earth, Jew and Gentile, saint and sinner. When our father Adam came into the Garden of Eden, he came into it with a celestial body and brought Eve, one of his wives, with him. He helped to make and organize this world. He is Michael, the archangel, the ancient of days, about whom holy men have written and spoken. He is our father and our God, and the only God with whom we have to do. Every man upon the earth, professing Christians or non-professing, must hear it and will know it sooner or later. Journal of Discourses, Volume 1, page 50. What about racism? Well... We can look at a quote from Brigham Young, again from the Journal of Discourses, and we have to apply a significant amount of bubble modesty, and we come up with the following quote. You see some classes of the human family that are black, couth, comely, agreeable, and their blessings of intelligence is generally bestowed upon mankind. Uh, Cain slew his brother. The Lord put a mark upon him. That curse is removed. The end. And that pretty much is consistent with the current 
framing of the issue of race in the church. Um, but if we were to go back and actually read the entire quote without the bubble modesty applied to it, it reads as follows. You see some classes of the human family that are black, uncouth, uncomely and disagreeable and low in their habits, wild and seemingly deprived of nearly all the blessings of intelligence that is generally bestowed upon mankind. The first man that committed the odious crime of killing one of his brethren will be cursed the longest of any one of the children of Adam. Cain slew his brother. Cain might have been killed, and that would have put a termination to that line of human beings. This was not to be. And the Lord put a mark upon him, which is the flat nose and the black skin. Trace mankind down to after the flood, and then another curse is pronounced upon the same race, that they should be servant of servants, and they will be until that curse is removed. And the abolitionists cannot help it, nor in the least alter that decree. How long is that race to endure the dreadful curse that is upon them? so on and so forth. The curse will remain upon them. Now, again, very different when you look at the original quote in its fullness versus how the church wants to depict its teachings today. And I think the last one we'll look at is blood atonement. Again, from our good friend Brigham Young, if we were to look at how they treat it in the era of uh, theological uh, bubble modesty, all mankind loves themselves, and let these principles be known by an individual, and he would be glad. That would be an external, ex eternal exaltation. Will you love your brothers or sisters likewise when they have committed a sin? Will you love that man or woman well? That is what Jesus Christ meant. He told a man or woman to love their enemies. He intended for those who have the spirit to discern between truth and error. Jesus Christ meant that we should love, period. And that's pretty consistent with how the church would depict Christ's sacrifice in the context of blood atonement today. But let's look again at the original quote without the theological bubble modesty. All mankind love themselves and let these principles be known by an individual and he would be glad to have his blood shed. That would be loving themselves, even to eternal exaltation. Will you love your brothers or sisters likewise when they have committed a sin that cannot be atoned without the shedding of their blood? Will you love that man or woman well enough to shed their blood? That is what Jesus Christ meant. He never told a man or woman to love their enemies in their wickedness, never. He never intended any such thing. His language is left as it is for those who read, who have the spirit to discern between truth and error. It was so left for those who can discern the things of God. Jesus Christ never meant that we should love a wicked man in his wickedness. Brigham Young teaches that Christ's atonement is not sufficient for all sins, and saints may have to shed people's blood for the victim to be forgiven. This is from Journal of Discourses for page 219. Okay. Now, once again, I have to repent for showing you such explicit images in their unadulterated forms. If you are like many Mormons, when first exposed to such raw and raunchy theological pornography, you feel dirty. There's an uncomfortable feeling that you can't believe that your revered prophets ever believed, taught, or recorded these vile things. You may have clicked on the images above to see if the quotes were really in church publications and felt sickened inside when you discovered that they were. You may have been incredulous that men who held the same revered priesthood as your leaders today would speak with that authority and teach such illicit things. These thoughts may have even led you to start questioning the reliability of the power or the men who claim to hold that power and authority. Now, to help you with your quandary, I will now provide you with some comforting images to bleach your mind and eyes of the above theological pornography. If you were alarmed that a prophet once taught that monogamy caused a man to wither and dry up, check out this nice image of a happy monogamous couple, a man and a woman with an inspiring quote from the recent General Conference. If we follow up, the Lord will never let us down. M. Russell Ballad. Now, do you feel the sense of uneasiness dissipating? Just pay attention to how vocal the church is now extolling the virtues of marriage between only one man and one woman. Focus on the message of the most recent general conference, not general conference from a hundred years ago. Those old prophets and teachers have absolutely nothing to do with today's church, at least not the parts that are covered up by bubble modesty. 
Now, if you were surprised that a prophet once taught that Adam was God the Father, then put your mind at ease while staring at this image of a majestic airplane and counsel to look to Jesus from the recent general conference. There's only one in whom your faith is always safe, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, Elder Russell M. Nelson. I don't know why they put an airplane image in there. That's supposed to be Dieter Eckdorf. Now, the creator of this meme obviously forgot that Uchtdorf is the pilot and Nelson is the heart surgeon, but that shouldn't detract from the message. Now, you've forgotten that Brigham Young... Now, you, you know, stare at that image and you've probably forgotten that Brigham Young ever taught that the whole Adam God thing, like, aren't airplanes cool? Now, if you were jarred by the utterly repugnant racist doctrine that early prophets taught, then check out these happy black people who are members. No one who looks at theological pornography of early church sermons and teachings in their unedited form could look this happy. Now look at these memes from General Conference that definitely show that black people are happy in the church and absolutely sustain the prophets, even the ones who carry the same priesthood authority that would have demanded acceptance of the racist teachings that Brigham Young and other early prophets gave before bubble modesty covered them up. The gospel is not weight, it's wings. It carries us. I sustain the prophet of God. Now, were you aghast at the idea that a prophet once taught that Christ's atoning blood was not sufficient to forgive all sins? And there are some sins that must literally have their own blood shed for in order to receive forgiveness? Let's put that theological pornography out of your mind and gaze intently at the following image and quote from General Conference. Our Savior has the power to cleanse and heal you. From Linda S. Reeves. When members fall into Satan's carefully orchestrated trap of reading naked and unedited speeches and teachings from early church prophets, they may start to have questions which would lead them to question church authority, reliability, and integrity. The regular general conferences and the PR machine built around them to give members only comforting and safe and modest messages give the members the equivalent of the fluffy bunny image I used above, a safe, comforting, reassuring, and cuddly image to take their minds away from the troubling teaches, teachings of past prophets. With those troubling images safely bleached from the members' minds and eyes, they can focus on what is really important, obedience. You can safeguard yourself against personal apostasy by keeping your covenants, obeying the commandments, following church leaders, partaking of the sacrament, and constantly strengthening your testimony through daily scripture study, prayer, and service. Obedience is your safeguard. Obedience to your church leaders, not not to past ones, mind you, the current ones. Obedience to church leaders is what will keep you in line. They've told you that reading the anti-Mormon information, which is really just church history, is pornography. We did it all for sending you. Do you believe it? Bubble porn is a way of covering up certain parts of the body that lets your mind fill in what is missing to see what it wants to see. Naked ladies and dudes. Bubble modesty is a way of covering up certain parts of church history which lets your mind fill in what is missing to see what it wants to see, a consistent and loving church with leaders who can be trusted to discern truth from error. Truth is not seeing what you want to see, but seeing things for what they actually are. Anyone who tells you to deny truth in order to maintain an illusion is setting you up to be abused or to abuse others. God blessed you with a mind and the faculty of reason so that each of you can search for truth and hold to it in the face of lies and deception. In The Wizard of Oz, the great voice of the wizard warned Dorothy to pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, but to focus on the grand voice and appearance of the great and powerful Wizard of Oz. Would Dorothy have made it home if she had simply obeyed? And that's the end of that. All right. So... That was uh, Mormon theological porn or modesty, depending on how you look at it. Uh, It was a fun thing to write back in the day. But uh, as we usually do, if you've got some thoughts that you'd like to share about what we just read, then I will see if I can get the phone lines working. And you can call 210-422-2222. And uh, we can um, take some calls in... In the meantime, looks like that's all set up correctly. I will see what comments we have. All right. Okay. 
Oil story said, this is weird and gross. It, it is a little com- uncomfortable. Um, <clears throat> Logan says, I can't watch this now, but the title piqued my interest. Of course it did. You, you're not going to click on something that says Mormon bubble porn? I mean, it's it's clickbait. I admit it. It is. All right. Uh, mental gymnastics. You get really good at it as a Mormon. That's absolutely true. Uh, again, if you want to join the conversation, you can dial 210-422-2222 and, uh, share any thoughts that you had about this. Okay. Uh, Trevor mentions, the one thing that's perplexed me is how Emma fell in love with Joseph and stuck with him for so long. She was smart, educated, and had a family who would take her back. You know, I think that's true whenever you study the life of anyone who's had such charisma and sway over other people even when they've gone into criminal activities or things that you would think no one else would um, tolerate or stand as they have such influence over them. And there's so many other factors when you're out on the frontier and um, you've been through persecution. It's just not as simple as walking away from someone. You could say the same thing of why do abused or battered uh, spouses go back to their partner? You know, it's very, very complicated. All right. And Oil Stories mentions that and affirms it. Um, You know, when you're in an abusive relationship, it's difficult to get out. Fear, pride, and any number of other factors uh, get in the way. Um, I don't know why Adam-God doctrine was rejected. Keeping it would have made Mormonism more theologically consistent and would have made the Garden of Eden story more legible in the context of Mormonism. That's an interesting point. The thing is, a lot of these different theological innovations that early Mormon... um, leaders came up with added some consistency to it you know the whole notion that god is a just god and that we have to deal with the fact that some people are born in positions of comfort and privilege and other people are born in very difficult position causes a lot of people to say well that's not very just god can't be just with these realities but mormon mormonism early on created a solution it said well actually there's there was a trial or a test in the pre-mortal existence and if you were good, then you were born in one of those favorable circumstances. And so it actually created an answer to these quandaries of life that was appealing because it answered those questions. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's see here. The church likes to pretend the brethren of all of one accord, never admitting that there are in fact and were factions and personality conflicts throughout. That is very true. And there's a couple of other episodes that will be coming up where we address the concept of unanimity in the quorum and whether that's actually a good thing or a huge freaking red flag that's something more than um, people authentically voting with their conscience is going on when you have issues like the November 15 policy and so forth. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see here. Max Jensen asked the question, in the real world, wouldn't this just be called deception or lying? Absolutely. I mean, what we're calling, what what the church is depicting its history as now is a whitewash of what it actually was. And I'd say that in the more recent um, historical narrative, there are becoming much more upfront about the uncomfortable nature of uh, facts and history because they can't avoid it anymore. I mean, when people have access to the original documents, you can't really misrepresent it to the extent that they were before. But now instead of outright hiding things, they're, they're giving a new framework for interpretation or a new conceptualization of church and history and all the while telling people to doubt their own conscience, doubt their own mental faculties, doubt their own judgment in analyzing historical facts so that they just continue to place their faith in the brethren with the ultimate goal of maintaining belief in the church. And that's just kind of their new strategy. Okay, Uh, let's see here. I think that's it. So if anyone wants to call in, the number is 210-422-2222. Without any calls, we will go ahead and end it there as a brief little episode covering a fun post from the Thoughts on Things and Stuff website. Uh, Things to look forward to in the coming weeks include a new series uh, that I have yet to come up with a good name for, something like uh, Trials of Faith or Trials of Undue Influence. 
where we're going to take representatives from a number of different backgrounds and apply something similar to the were you raised in a cult quiz that was recently um, published on the Mormon Stories podcast. We've modified and updated the type of questionnaire that you would run, but we're going to bring some people who have come out of some organizations, not necessarily religions, but they're going to reflect back on what their experience was in that organization and give it a score. And I'm hoping that it's not all going to be positive. I think that for the test to actually be useful, you have to talk to someone who's come out of an organization or is in the organization, allow them to score it according to how they feel, and then it won't come up as, you know, that they are dealing with a cult, although we're probably not going to frame it around the word cult. Um, So that is coming up. Uh, And then we also hope to have a series on logical fallacies and really trying to dig down and come up with some good examples of how to understand certain logical fallacies and then look how they've been employed, both in the context of Mormonism as well as in other areas, just so that we can have a series of videos to point to whenever we're trying to explain to anyone um, some of those concepts. So... um, Exactly. And I'm hoping that MLM is going to be one of our first ones. So um, (laughs) with that being said, we will go ahead and close things down. And uh, until next time, this has been Talk on Things and Stuff. Take care.